It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10. Our top story. Inside China's closed and controversial region, why thousands of Uyghurs have been moved from re-education camps. It's really an incredible eeriness to this place, and it just is completely abandoned. Signs of what used to be are everywhere, though. We speak to relatives of those now detained and see how the prison population has massively grown. Also tonight, knocking their socks off a shoeless prime minister at a summit in Japan insists he'll remain prime minister once British voters have their say. The questions for Scotland's first minister, as he can't say whether this man who abducted a schoolgirl while dressed as a woman won't be detained in a women's jail. Cleaning up their act for £10 billion, England's water companies and a costly pledge. It's uh, read every uh, training manual we've ever used with our team. It's read every bit of regulation. A game changer or job killer? Why AI may already be on course to replace thousands of jobs. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in our press preview from 10.30. Good evening. For years, the so-called re-education camps in China's Xinjiang province have been a symbol of the oppression of its Muslim Uyghur minority. Tonight, we have evidence many have now closed, but the threat is far from over. Instead, we've seen what appears to be a huge increase in prison accommodation, and we've spoken to at least one relative whose loved one has been sent there. Well, since 2017, Uyghurs have been subjected to a program of intense oppression. At its height, it's estimated between 1 million and 2 million Uyghur people were imprisoned. Evidence from leaked police files shows people as young as 15 and as old as 73 were detained. Back in 2021, the US government determined the actions of the Chinese government in Xinjiang amounted to genocide and crimes against humanity. Our Asia correspondent, Helen Ann Smith, visited 22 sites across Xinjiang province. On the streets of Xinjiang, there is still a tension and signs of what this place has been through. Heavy police, regular stops, a sense they're always watching. It is now infamous for its brutal oppression of the Muslim Uyghur minority. And there are questions as to how far that policy is ongoing. It is the camps that characterize the crackdown, places like this. Experts and survivors say it once held Uyghurs, arrested en masse and subject to so-called re-education. But we found it dusty, deserted. It's really an incredible eeriness to this place. I and mean, it just is completely abandoned. Signs of what used to be are everywhere, though. Around the front, one building cordoned off from the rest appeared to be acting as temporary housing. And some of the buildings over there, are they, are they empty? I don't know, this man says. There were people here when I first arrived. That ominous looking camp was built where we had beautiful dreams as children. It's unbearable, it's unthinkable. This place is haunting for Memetian. He knows his brother Emetian was held here. It might be closed, but his brother is not free. After two years here without charge, a police officer told him what happened next. According to the police officer, he said that my brother had a sensitive book which was banned by the government. Uh, impromptu kind of court was held, court hearing was held in the camp and he was sentenced to 14 years. China says everyone held for re-education has now graduated. Over 90% of the re-education camps we visited were visibly no longer being used for this purpose. Most now appear to be schools. The reality may be far more complex. In fact, while arrests spiked in 2017 at the height of the crackdown, they remain higher than they were before it started. Prosecutions jumped up too, and there was a huge increase in average sentences meaning most of those people will still be locked up. 
But if not in the camps, then where? What we're now doing is taking a trip further outside the city centre because what we've heard is that the camps that are further out are more likely to be still used for that purpose and that's also where some of the larger prisons are that we think in some cases might have been expanded. Some, it seems, they did not want us to see. We found all the roads to one large cluster of facilities were blocked. Those we did reach were fearsome. Eight in total, all clearly operational. And satellites show some have recently expanded. In 2018, towards the end of the crackdown, this site hadn't even been started. Watchtowers added just recently. And here too, a prison right next to a re-education camp extended, while the camp part had its walls and watchtowers removed. The initial wave of arrests might have passed, but the fear they've wrought has not. This woman is one of the very rare few to have escaped within the last two years. Even from a place of safety, she is visibly terrified. It's all lies. Most people are still inside. Although it looks as if everything's normal, people who were deemed a bit problematic are taken always, and no one knows where they've been taken to. They don't say anything about what happened to them when they were inside, but it's obvious that they've experienced extreme horror. In response to our story, China's foreign ministry said allegations of the camps are sheer lies and that vocational schools helped people break away from terrorist and extremist ideas. Everyone has now graduated. The message is that everything is normal here now. The crackdown may be less visible. For many, it still feels very real. Helen Ann Smith, Sky News in Xinjiang. Our correspondent inside Xinjiang there. Now, the leaders of the world's biggest advanced economies are gathering in Japan tonight with a further crackdown on Russia's economy on the agenda. An EU official said the country's lucrative diamond trade will be discussed. Rishi Sunak will be part of the global talks, but has also spoken about his domestic future. More on that in a moment. But first, from Hiroshima, our political editor, Beth Rigby, reports. A warning, there is some flash photography. Rishi Sunak and his wife, Akshata Murti, arriving in Tokyo, hoping to cement his growing status on the international stage. The PM at a naval base this morning, greeted with pomp and a parade which rose to the occasion. A show of military might, protecting peace in this region, their priority to counter an increasingly unpredictable China. The UK signing a defence agreement with Japan with the aim of strengthening security, economic and technological ties. We're increasing our engagement in the region to work with allies like Australia, like Japan, to ensure that the Pacific region does remain free and open. We don't want to see any change to the status quo by force or coercion. This region is going to be increasingly important to our economic prospects at home. If you look at where global growth is going to come from over the coming decades, the Indo-Pacific region is going to be increasingly important. Important because money matters to people back home. This afternoon, the PM mingling with businesses, celebrating Japanese investment for jobs in the UK. I'm delighted to announce new investment commitments worth nearly £18 billion. This is a huge vote of confidence in the UK economy. And with that, the whistle-stop tour continued. On to Hiroshima as the G7 leaders assembled. The mood, one of optimism, determination and unity. But the geopolitical outlook, bleak. War in Ukraine, a rogue Russia and rising aggression from China. These allies have plenty of problems. And the task here in Hiroshima this weekend is to not just show a united front, but a preparedness for action too. Tonight, Mr Sunak meeting his Japanese counterpart, sporting socks featuring PM Kishida's favourite baseball team. A small gesture, but with big intent. This a relationship and region of growing importance and where much is at stake. And Beth is in Hiroshima for us tonight. Uh, Beth, global security and the war in Ukraine on the Prime Minister's agenda there, but also his political future at home. 
Yes, that's right, Gillian. I'm here in Hiroshima. It's a very wet morning here, as you can see. Uh, this is the day that the G7 conference really kicks off. But the Prime Minister, as you said, being asked to about matters back home. And uh, on the plane over, uh, we asked him, I asked him about whether or not he was confident he would still be Prime Minister after the next general election in light of those local election results. And I got an emphatic yes. He said, I'm working hard to deliver for the British people. He said he was confident he could. He said he knows things are tough right now. And he said, I think I've made good progress in the six months I've been in the job. I'm just going to keep at it. Uh, the Prime Minister also emphatically ruled out any coalition deals, saying that he wasn't interested in talking about deals. He wouldn't do a deal with the DUP. It might be a hypothetical question anyway, given that it's not far from clear whether the DUP would want to deal with the Conservatives over after what's happened with post-Brexit trading arrangements. But that was the kind of domestic line, if you like, uh, coming out as we came over uh, to Japan. Now, today in in Hiroshima, uh, big international talks really kick off and high on the agenda, of course, is the war in Ukraine. And I talked in my piece about actions, not just words, when it comes to Ukraine. Look out today for sanctions, growing sanctions. Uh, it's expected that the UK could announce uh, further trade in sanctions. Might there be action on banning Russian diamonds into the UK market? Uh, is the Prime Minister going to announce a new raft of sanctions? And will other G7 leaders follow? It looks like there could be a coordinated effort here uh, to increase sanctions and send a strong message to Moscow here from Hiroshima. OK, Beth, thank you very much. Uh, Beth Rigby there in Hiroshima for us tonight. Now, the fate of the transgender rapist Isla Bryson was one of the factors blamed for the fall of Nicola Sturgeon. Now her successor as Scotland's first minister has faced questions over another similar case. Hamza Yousaf couldn't say whether a man who is transitioning to be a woman might be held in a women's prison after he admitted abducting and sexually assaulting a schoolgirl. Our Scotland correspondent, Connor Gillies, reports. Here is the face of a paedophile whose crimes have traumatised a schoolgirl for life. 53-year-old butcher Andrew Miller. And here is the same person identifying as Amy George, seen in February luring a youngster into his car while dressed as a woman. Thinking she was safe, she accepted a lift home before the predator locked the child in his bedroom for hours, subjecting her to repeated sex attacks. Today, Miller admitted it all. The court hearing the child only escaped and phoned 999 after her abuser fell asleep. The judge here described these crimes as abhorrent and every parent's worst nightmare. Sentencing will come in August, but there has been a major row here in Scotland about where to detain trans prisoners. That led to a policy change, meaning their birth gender overrides everything. Miller will therefore be detained in a male prison. The scandal earlier this year surrounded trans double rapist Isla Bryson being temporarily detained in a women's prison. First Minister, can you Sky News questioned Scotland's First Minister in light of this fresh case. Well, first of all, can I say that this is a gut-wrenching case, uh, heartbreaking. You know, I cannot think of the trauma the victim and the, the family of the victim and, in fact, the community uh, are, are going through. Uh, I can confirm, uh, of course, that Andrew Miller is being held uh, in a male prison, but I can't say which one and I can't go into the details. And will he continue to stay in a male prison? Uh, well, again, it, look, this is a live case. The sentencing is still to happen, so I can't comment any further. But, of course, he is being held in the male estate. But can you rule out that he will not be moved I to a mean, women's I, prison? I, I cannot comment on a live case. You should know that. Political déjà vu in a polarising issue as Andrew Miller, Amy George prepare for a long period behind bars. Conor Gillis, Sky News. Edinburgh. The rise of artificial intelligence is like a freight train heading towards the workforce. The boss of one energy company has told Sky News workers at BT may know exactly how he feels after the telecoms giant announced today that around 10,000 jobs will be replaced by advanced AI in the next seven years. Our business correspondent Paul Kelso reports. I would definitely say that's something that we should do. When you pick up the phone to a company, this is what you hope you'll get. 
a human to help. Sure, I can set that up for you over the phone. But send an email to Octopus Energy and the answer might now start with artificial intelligence. It's answering 44% of customer emails just seven weeks after it was introduced. It's read every email we've ever sent to a customer. It's uh, read every uh, training manual we've ever used with our team. It's read every bit of regulation. I mean, it's read every bit of the arcane back end of energy. It kind of just knows it all, right? The boss says AI won't cost jobs here, but it is a threat to workers in the wider economy. Around the world, governments are quite quickly uh, beginning to think about what they have to do here. Uh, but we haven't got time to wait and see because, uh, you know, look, if a freight train's coming at you, you don't wait till you feel it hit before moving out of the way, that'll be too late. Generative AI is changing the workplace fast. This London law firm has a bespoke AI tool being used by 3,500 lawyers in 43 countries just three months after it was launched. On an individual basis, it's a boring productivity gain, really. It's an hour or two a week, but when you multiply that by 3,500, that is a big deal for a business. Mm. What? Before this existed, would that have been a realistic target if you'd been no. asked to find, no. <laughs> go off and find impossible. me three and a half thousand hours? Yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. To, it was impossible to find these productivity gains through a single deployment of a system a year ago. We couldn't have done this. Job losses are inevitable. BT says it will replace 10,000 workers with advanced AI by 2030, and they won't be the only ones. Government has no plans to legislate, but unions say rapid adoption of AI threatens workers' rights. We say that at the very moment at which regulation is most needed, when the technologies are developing so rapidly and the implications are so significant, instead of regulating, the government is putting forward flimsy and vague proposals that don't have any statutory footing. Artificial intelligence could trigger an industrial revolution for white collar work with the prospect of huge productivity gains coming with warnings that millions of jobs might cease to exist. I can't know where that balance between promise and pain will settle. AI will create new roles even as it consumes old jobs, but the speed of change is fast turning science fiction into a fact of working life. Paul Kelso, Sky News. Two teenagers are beginning life sentences tonight over the murder of a schoolboy. Kyrie McLean was just 15 when he was stabbed after leaving school in Huddersfield. One of his fellow pupils told Sky News everyone wanted to carry a knife for protection there. Shingi Maurike reports. For Charlie McLean, the death of her son Kyrie meant she lost the most important thing in her world. Today, the two teenagers who murdered him were given life sentences. In a statement read out on her behalf outside of court, she simply asked, why? I now ask myself, what has this achieved? What has my son died for? Nobody has won in this situation. I've lost a child and other parents have lost two children who have been, who committed this offence and are now in prison. This violence has to stop. 15-year-old Jaquil Pusey was sentenced to a minimum of 17 years in prison. His cousin, 17-year-old Giovanni Harriet, sentenced to a minimum of 18 years. The court heard how the pair lay in wait for Kyrie outside his school in black clothes and balaclavas for a pre-planned attack that saw a 30 centimetre blade plunged into his chest. Outside the gates, the ties, trinkets and tributes are reminders of how the victim was still a student. The killing of a 15-year-old in broad daylight as he walked home from school shocked his friends, family and the wider community here in Huddersfield. It's also raised questions about an increase in knife crime across West Yorkshire. AJ, who goes to the same school, says it's violence that is now commonplace. Everyone wants to carry a knife for protection around here. Like, I know a lot of people do. But again, like, you know, you just got to constantly look over your shoulder. Even though I'm not involved in any, any, any of that, obviously I come here as well. But still, you, just, you don't feel safe no more. At this boxing club, they've made it their mission to address the issue. It's one close to home. Kyrie trained here briefly before he died. I've lost four children now I've dealt with in the last four years to knife crime. Um, Kyrie came here as part of the school initiative we put, we put on, and it breaks my heart. For a mother, this loss has left a hole that will never be filled. 
it's always those lives that have been devastated that bring the cruelty of knife crime into focus. Shingi Marike, Sky News, Leeds Crown Court. The RMT Rail Union has announced another strike for Friday the 2nd of June. The walkout will affect 14 train companies and involve 20,000 station staff, train managers and catering staff. Meanwhile, the National Education Union says its teachers will hold another round of strikes in July if their long-running dispute over pay hasn't been resolved by mid-June. The NEU is reballoting its members to seek a mandate for another six months of industrial action. The Treasury has revealed that the late Queen's funeral and lying in state last year cost more than £160 million. The Home Office, which provided policing and security, shouldered the biggest share of nearly at nearly £74 million. The party goods business, founded by the parents of the Princess of Wales, has been sold after it failed to avoid collapsing into administration. The sale of party pieces holdings was done using what's known as a pre-pack administration. That means it had appointed insolvency practitioners before being sold without some of its liabilities. The port of Whitstable in Kent is famous for its oysters, but one seller we spoke to today said he's importing them from Jersey because of concerns over sewage in the water there. The trade is just one of the victims of inadequate sewage systems, something the industry promised to spend £10 billion improving today. Customers, though, will pay for it, as Ashna Huranag reports. It's long been our waterway's big, dirty secret. Tons of filthy water, often sewage, pumped into rivers and seas. Whitstable in Kent is no exception. Oh. It's why Jean and her friends have been avoiding it. <laughs> this is their first dip in six months. I bring my grandchildren down here in the summer and I know, I'm not sure whether they should be allowed in the water or not because you never quite know, do you? And it's, it's a worry with young kids. Now there's a £10 billion pledge to clean up our sewers. And this admission, it should have been solved years ago. I'm here on behalf of the water industry to say sorry. Sorry for the spills of untreated sewage that have gone into our rivers and onto our beaches. And to say today, we get it. We've listened, uh, we've heard, we understand the public upset and anger that there has been about this issue. And we have a plan to put it right. A plan that will see shareholders make an initial investment, but then eventually will be passed on to customers. Since 2010, water companies have paid over £20 billion to their shareholders, according to the University of Greenwich. And last year, there were more than 389,000 spills across Britain, which campaigners say we shouldn't have to pay for. It's just so enormously frustrating when you see that they're taking a billion pounds plus a year in dividends and the CEOs are getting paid 25 million pounds a year and then we're being told, well, if you want this issue fixed, you're going to have to pay again, but we've already paid for it. Well, this is the oyster purification centre where all the oysters are actually should be purified. In the oyster capital of the UK, business owners like Graham depend on the water quality, but he stopped relying on the ones on his doorstep, instead spending £1,200 a week to get them from elsewhere. I've gone to Jersey's because I can guarantee that if I sell this to a restaurant, I'm not going to have any comebacks. If I sell this to a restaurant, they're not going to have any issues. Whereas? Whereas if I use local water, I do not know. This, the price of keeping his reputation intact. But for water companies wanting to fix theirs, the cost will be far steeper. Ashna Harinag, Sky News, in Whitstable. Finally, last night on Sky News at 10, we covered the claims by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex of a near-catastrophic car chase by paparazzi in New York. Today, what actually happened is not much clearer. The view from America's media, though, is, as our US correspondent Mark Stone reports, a warning, this story contains flash photography throughout. From NBC News, this is Today. Predictably, the Sussex's Manhattan drama was the morning show's headline news. The American obsession with the royals, ostracized or not, playing out on their streets. The tabloids here have their views, of course. It's less a couple hounded, much more a couple of hypocrites. They've left New York now and left the dust to settle on the varying versions of the events of Tuesday night. Megan, 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 Megan.
It was at about 10 p.m. when Harry, Meghan and her mother left the Ziegfeld Ballroom in Manhattan with private security. They headed towards where they were staying on the Upper East Side. They were then driven across 57th Street, up and down Franklin D. Roosevelt East River Drive and other streets for about an hour and 15 minutes. Sky News understands the couple then entered the 19th Precinct Police Station, the first of three times that night, in an attempt to lose the photographers. At 11 p.m., they left the police station in a yellow taxi, driving south on Park Avenue before returning. On the third occasion, they stayed for about 15 minutes and were then transferred into an SUV, which headed to their friend's house. All of a sudden, paparazzi came out of nowhere and just started flashing, uh, taking pictures, and, uh, you know, and they didn't stop until the security got out and said, move, move, move. The takeaway from all this, of course, is that as ever, there are starkly different accounts of what happened, how near catastrophic this really was. It's certainly true that New York's traffic, even at night, gives ample opportunity for photographers to do what Harry resents, what he fears so much. But the eternal tension is of a couple who want a private life in the public eye on their terms. Prince Harry has faced these challenges since he was a young child. He's been in the public eye and will continue to be in the public eye. They have to find um, the right balance doing the things that are important to them in a public role with the privacy that they crave. Deeply intrusive or a situation they help to create. Either way, the context, of course, is the tragedy of Harry's past. Mark Stone, Sky News in New York. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview, including this story on the front page of The Guardian. The headline reads, Fresh sanctions against Russia as PM seeks to rally support for Kiev. Tonight, we're going to be joined by the Daily Express columnist and broadcaster, Carol Malone, and the Belfast Telegraph columnist, Alison Morris. Do stay with us for more.